Well, good evening. Glad you could join me again on this lovely Tuesday, the 14th day of March. Now I'm going to pop the top off this last little nightcap here. And hopefully it's not going to explode in my face. Here it goes. Drinkable. Hmm. First of a new batch. Anyway, I had to lift the lid on that just to get started. So tonight's topic, I'm actually wanting to talk about the moon because I hear so much, uh, I don't know, conjecture about it. And all of it is, is conjecture. Like, just because you can measure the temperature of moonlight or the temperature of an object that moonlight has fallen upon has no bearing whatsoever upon what the source of the moon's light is. People claim that that's evidence that the moon is its own source of light and it produces a cold light. Now that is the most unscientific thing I've ever heard. Anything that produces light produces heat. So to say that the moon's light is a cooling light makes zero sense. Now I have talked about it several times before so I'll briefly mention it again. But there's a method of cooling which uses evaporative heat. Now if you think about it when everything goes dark everything obviously cools down, though technically it's still warm from the, the sunlight during the day, depending on what temperature it was to start with. Now if the moon's light causes, say you've got a surface of road, half of it's covered with the shade of a tree still, the other half is lit by the bright moonlight under a full moon. Now what that light could actually be doing is causing a slight evaporative effect which would cause it to cool faster than the part still in the shade, which is still retaining the warmth. So to automatically conclude, because of the temperature of the objects that the moon's light is on is cooler, is not conclusive proof that the moon produces its own light. That's just jumping to a false conclusion because somebody said it and you thought, that sounds like a good idea. And so you do the test yourself and say, oh, wow, it is cooler. That proves it. It proves jack shit. Now, the other thing too, there's a lot of people still don't understand perspective and physics. And on both models, the globe Earth and the flat Earth model, the moon still makes sense to be lit by the sun. Now, believe me, I've been studying the moon most of my life. I'm a big fan of the moon so to speak I've always been watching it I always make a habit of going and watching the full moon rising and you know how when it's time to do that because when you look at your moon calendar and you see what date the full moon is which was last night then you go out at sunset that's how it works so on the ball earth model as the sun's setting below right because of our spin that's when it, it makes the moon appear to rise on the eastern horizon and so because it's more or less in between the sun and the moon, that's why the moon appears full. And then the next day it comes up an hour later, so it's not quite full. And then it's another hour later again, so but the angles are always slightly that little bit off. <laughs> and it works the same on the flat Earth. Now, a lot of people use the argument, though, to dispute the ball Earth model that if that's the case, then we should be getting far more eclipses, like it should be eclipsed almost every full moon. Now, that is small-minded thinking, very small-minded thinking. See, what you're not aware of, obviously, in the 3D model, with the Earth spinning on its axis, going around the sun, with the little moon chasing around it, lagging by an hour every day, is that the moon is on its own trajectory which is constantly changing. If you have a decent moon chart and you know anything about astrology whatsoever, 
then you'll know that the moon changes houses of the zodiac every two and a half days. That's why I have the moon chart, because it's a, a gardening guide. When the moon is waxing, getting bigger from new to full, and it's in a, the signs that you've got your four cardinal signs, it's a bit like earth, air, fire, and water. And the, in astrology, no, there's only three, astronomy, astrology. Um, it's basically fertile, semi-fertile, infertile. And they go in groups of four because you've got four, hmm, how does it work? There's 12 houses, three fours at 12. Anyway, I have to, I haven't got a current moon chart at the moment, but basically for two and a half days, it's in a fertile sign, then it's in an infertile sign, or a semi-fertile sign. And then it keeps changing through the cycles from one house to the next. So the water signs and the earth signs are your fertile ones, your air and fire ones are your infertile signs. And so basically it's changing every two and a half days. The sun takes 30 days. That's why your star signs for the sun, well it's basically a full moon actually. Star signs for the sun change once a month, once a moon, but the moon itself is changing every couple of days, which means that in relation between us and the sun, very, very rarely does it actually line up perfectly with the earth in the middle, which is that's when you get the eclipse, maybe once or twice a year. You're not going to get it every single month. The next time, you know, you've got to think 3D. The moon is off on an angle, but it's still rising at the sunset off at this other angle, so you've got the moon, Earth back here a little bit, but you know, only a little bit. So it's got to be very precise for the Earth's shadow to fall on the moon during an eclipse with your globe Earth model. Now in the flat Earth model, we do have to reproduce a little bit of black magic here, but I think we've all heard about the planet. They call it, some call it Rahu, some call it Nibiru. It goes by a few different names. It's not a far distant sun, what it's, or planet, it's actually a, a dark sun. And often lately, people have been coming up with a lot of pictures, especially around sunset, where you can see another, what looks to be a sun, further behind the sun, roughly the same size as it. Now, I think that is, is Rahu, which is a dark black sun, basically. But when it's lined up at that time of day, enough sunlight hits it that you can actually see it. And so a lot of people are having this mysterious, I've even seen videos of it, lots of still pictures, the occasional video where it looks like there's a second sun. But it's usually only at sunset that you can see it. So this Rahu then, maybe it is like a moon to the sun. And what is actually happening in an eclipse is that Rahu is coming between our moon and the sun. Not the Earth's shadow at all, but this other thing. Because when you watch the eclipse, and I've watched a couple, like those blood moons as they call them, the shadow coming onto the moon is coming from the opposite side of what you'd expect it to do. You know, if the Earth is sort of setting, or if Earth is spinning towards the moon, and the sun is sinking below, the shadow should come from the bottom up, but it comes from the top down, or close to it. It's actually more from a funny angle from the sort of top left, the last one I saw. So, in this instance then, if it is this third celestial body that's actually causing the eclipses, and obviously we can watch when the sun gets eclipsed by the moon, we can see that the moon goes in front of the sun. So there's your eclipses solved. And therefore, the light of the sun can still be very, very easily be the cause of the illumination of the moon because they're both up in the sky. And when the moon is closer to us, it's still able to capture the sunlight. There's nothing between it, except when it's been eclipsed, between it at that vast distance that's stopping the sunlight from hitting it, and yet it's, but it's at that angle compared to us, so we see it going through different phases. 
it's only when they're sort of more or less balanced perfectly that we see it as full. Now, now getting back to this, to the moonlight's heat once again, to expect heat to come from the moon, other than that tiny bit of evaporative effect, as I suspect it may be, that causes the cooling effect. Why would you expect heat? I mean, you look at a a hot oven. Now, here, let's not use an oven. Let's use a hot building, a really hot rock or a building, either one. It's been illuminated on a hot day by the sun. That building is getting super hot, like not super duper, but you can see the building because it's lit by the sunlight. But do you expect that the light reflected off that building is going to produce heat at any distance whatsoever? Why would it? It's just a building. And if the moon is just some sort of rock or artificial spaceship filled with helium, some kind of death star, some sort of artificial something or other, then why would it reflect heat? Do you expect, you know, and it's not until you actually got up and touched it, like when you walk up and touched a hot building or your hot rock sitting in the sun, that you're going to feel the heat. You don't expect to feel it, feel it from 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away. 200 miles away, whatever the moon's distance might actually be, you're not going to feel heat. Why would you expect to feel heat if it's it's not reflecting sunlight because it's not a mirror, it's just a bloody natural-looking rock, basically. And so, yeah, you're not going up and touching it to feel heat. Why would the light that you see from it that's enough to light up at the night time, why would it produce heat? Just because the rest of the area is dark doesn't mean you'd feel any heat. It's crazy. It's like saying getting a mirror up at night time and getting a, looking at a reflection of a fire half a bloody block away and saying, oh, I feel no heat. So the source of light coming from this is its own source of light and it's a cooling light. It's how crazy it is to say that about the moon. So think about your theories through before you go throwing them around and thinking you know everything when it comes to, oh, well, the moonlight causes cool light so therefore it's its own source of light. It's just nonsense. Any source of light produces heat, especially when you're close enough to it. But if it's just reflected off another light source, you're not going to feel any heat whatsoever unless you go up and touch it. So the moon doesn't produce its own light. Get over that one, please, Mr. Flat Earthers and Mrs. Flat Earthers. It's not a valid argument. It's a very, very poorly thought out one. And it does our movement no great favours either way. So there you go. You can prove the moon phases both with the globe model and with the flat model. They both can make sense, which is why the globe model has stood the test of time for so long until we put it to the test and find another way of making it work. Now, what makes the sun and the moon hang up in the sky? Well, that's as I've said. You then have to go into a bit of sort of spiritual thinking and think that, the Earth is a sp spiritual realm. There is more to it than just sheer and utter physics. If we're going to have a sun moving around, some sort of electromagnetic levitation perhaps, the moon doesn't make a lot of sense unless we take into account, you know, a lot of cultures have talked of a time when there was no moon many thousands of years ago. And... So if it is an artificial spaceship of some sort, and it is, some say it's a, a weaponized type of thing, that it's actually causing aging, it's causing more wilder storms than we should be getting, it's causing women to menstruate, if you ask me. Like, no other animal menstruates according to the moon. They might have one or two seasons a year. Women, every month, all around the year. It's particularly somehow affecting our vibration deliberately, and if you ask me, I think the archons are somehow involved with it. Some sort of creatures anyway that don't particularly like us, and they want the earth. They want to inherit the earth. They don't want us to have it. But we, as God's children, are the rightful inheritors of it. But we have to then be rightful, be worthy, and fight for what we want. We can't just sit back and let this crazy moon make us go insane lunatics and so on so I think the sun is of God as I said in my previous round it 
is, well, Lucifer, the great angel of light, the morning star. That's what the morning star actually means. It's the sun, not Venus. And it is the conduit, the portal between heaven and earth that allows just the right amount of light to come in to produce life on the Mother Earth. So the Father, Son, the Mother Earth, and the Holy Children. No ghosts, no spirits. Air is a great angel. Water is a great angel. Sunlight is a great angel. Moonlight is an artificial construct put up by the great deceiver to look like a natural satellite. But it's not. It's something artificial, and it's part of the prison for our mind that we have to... Once we overcome the, the mysteries of the moon and free our minds from the imprisonment, that is part of our movement to become free. When we free our mind, we're no longer controlled by government mind control. We become anarchists, people who can think for ourselves, govern ourselves, be free and loving and create heaven on earth. That's what we're here to do. Have a good one. Talk to you next time.